Hello, my name is Susie Leaf and I'm the Director of Anglican Futures. Today in this presentation, we're going to be considering the Global Anglican Future Conference or GAFCON that will be taking place in Kigali in Rwanda in April 2023. We'll be trying to put it into some kind of historical and theological context. It's not an easy task, and this will be something of a whistle-stop tour, but hopefully by the end of the session, we'll be in a better place to understand how we've reached the stage we're at. The presentation is based on some events we held last week, but we've had so many requests for a recording, uh, I'm going to do this straight to camera today. I apologise in advance for any muddles or mistakes that I make. So let's get started. We're going to approach this by first of all thinking about GAFCON in the way that it's determined itself as a rescue mission, to think about what's at stake, to think about how the issue should have been married, ma managed according to Anglican polity and in terms of the global communion. We're going to think about why GAFCON was needed in 2008, what GAFCON's achieved over the last 15 years, why GAFCON is needed still in 2023, and what the future might hold so that we can prepare and pray in context. So first, let's go to Jerusalem, where in 2008, over a thousand people gathered from around the world and heard Archbishop Akinola, who was at the time the primate of the Church of Nigeria, say these words. Our beloved Anglican communion must be rescued from the manipulation of those who denied the gospel and its power to transform and to save. Those who departed from the scripture and the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. From those who are proclaiming a new gospel, which is really no gospel to support at all. And in the wisdom and strength God supplies, we must rescue what is left of the church from the error of the apostates. This was serious language, uh, calling uh, that the, the, some of the church had uh, apostatized, but it was also loving language. Um, there was a real desire to rescue the Anglican communion. Um, they weren't leaving, they weren't a breakaway group. This was a rescue mission. And if we move forward 15 years uh, to the um, heart of the Anglican Communion, some would say, uh, the Mother Church, the Church of England, uh, when they had their synod uh, this um, February and put forward legislation where, though the doctrine of marriage wouldn't change, um, there would be prayers uh, of blessing uh, for those who had entered into all kinds of um, same-sex or heterosexual relationships. The Church of England is in a new place and, and I'm really pleased with the decisions we've made. So it means that um, once these prayers are formally commended later this year, that faithful, stable Christian couples in a civil marriage or a civil partnership can, if they wish, come to church and that you know, their love for each other in that relationship can be acknowledged, celebrated, and the couple can receive a blessing. That's never happened before. Mm. I'm pleased about that. But at the same time, I think I'd need to say, I'm not standing here full of joy because I think the debate has, has clearly revealed divisions in the church over, over these issues. And, and those divisions cut across, you know, we're, we're a family and when families disagree, it's always painful. Um, so, so I'm also very committed, and it, and it dawned on me really through the debate that actually we could also today be doing something else very, very beautiful. And there were some very moving speeches from different people on, I don't like the language of sides, from different places saying this. We need reassurance that we have a place within the church. And if we can have that reassurance, we could do something incredibly beautiful, which is walk together with our disagreements. So what's at stake? Two archbishops... Uh, speaking apparently about two totally different things. But Archbishop Akinola talking about two Gospels, the Archbishop of York talking about the blessing of same-sex unions and the differences that have appeared within the Church of England. On the surface, Gafgon and the wider divisions in the Anglican communion do appear to be about matters of human sexuality. And certainly in this presentation, we will trace recent history in relation to decisions of churches and provinces have made in relation to ordaining and consecrating those in same-sex unions and blessing same-sex unions. However, like an iceberg, the real danger is not the presenting issue, but what is found beneath the, the surface. And that's because in coming to a decision to bless same-sex unions, anyone, a church or an individual, 
has to alter their understanding of what Christians have always believed about a whole range of issues, about human identity as created beings, as what God teaches us about human relationships. We have to change our views of the nature of sin and our need for salvation. In fact, it even impacts the nature of God as Trinity and Christ's divinity. And all this comes because of an undermining of the authority of scripture. And in fact, in the background to so much of this, we just hear that serpent's voice in the Garden of Eden saying, did God really say? No one would have chosen to take a stand on issues of human sexuality. It's too painful for too many people. But this is the issue of today and the place where the gospel is being attacked. And as Luther once said, it does not help that one of you would say, I will gladly confess Christ and his word on every detail, except that I may keep silent about one or two things which my tyrants may not tolerate, such as the form of the sacraments and the like. But whoever denies Christ in one detail or word has denied the same Christ in that one detail, who was denied in all the details, since there is only one Christ in all his words, taken together or individually. We can't pick and choose what Christ says. Similarly, and another quote that's often attributed to Martin Luther, if I profess with the loudest voice and clearest of exposition, every portion of the word of God, except precisely that little point which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, I'm not confessing Christ, however boldly I may be professing him. And so we are called as Christians uh, to consider these issues compassionately, uh, but we must take a stand. The Book of Common Prayer gives us um, a prayer for the state of the Christ's church militants here on earth. And in it, it calls us to beseech on the Lord, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity and concord. And grant that all that they that do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. And that's what Gascon longs for. That's what all Christians long for to live in unity and godly love. But we see from the doctrine placed there in the Book of Common Prayer, how do we do that? By agreeing in the truth of thy holy word. And that's one of the things that we've seen turned on its head over the last couple of decades. The 39 articles are the um, sort of uh, the closest that the um, church feeling gets to a confession of faith. Uh, interestingly, they were put together in order to bring to an end uh, the ma many, many debates that have been taking place uh, during the Reformation. And if we look at the church, at the 39 articles, we'll see that the Church of England never presumed that there would be a perfect church. Although in the visible church, the evil be ever mingled with the good and sometimes the evil have chief authority in the ministration of the word and sacraments, Article 26. And in Article 21, we see when they, the general councils, be gathered together for as much as they be an assembly of men, where have all be not governed with the spirit and the word of God, they may err and sometimes have erred, even in things pertaining unto God. So the Church of England has never seen itself as a perfect church, but it has said that here on earth there needs to be an ordered church. And so even if we have those wicked ministers um, in place, Christ's ordinances, the grace of God's gifts, would not be diminished by being given to us by wicked ministers. However, nevertheless, it appertains to the discipline of the church that inquiry be made of evil ministers and that they may be accused by those that have knowledge of their offences and finally being found guilty by just judgment be deposed. So we have a church which isn't perfect, but is ordered. We also interestingly see that even back in the time of the Reformation, it was to be a diverse church. It isn't necessary that traditions and ceremonies be in all places one or utterly alike, for at all times they've been diverse and may be changed according to the diversity of countries, times and men's manners, so that nothing be ordained against God's word. Whosoever thought, though, his, through his private judgment, willingly and purposefully doth openly break the traditions and ceremonies of the church, which be not repugnant to the word of God and be ordained and approved by common authority, ought to be rebuked openly, that others may fear to do the like. So here we have a diverse church within boundary, where nothing should be ordained against God's word. And why is it that the Anglican Communion is a global church? Why did the Church of England end up as a global church? Well, that's a lot to do with the um, England's uh, colonial past. 
as uh, English people went out around the world, uh, first as they went um, doing business, uh, then as they went ruling places, and also as missionaries, uh, we saw the spread of the Anglican way of doing church into different parts of the world. And because of that, um, links to the colonial past, we also have links to the time of independence as churches, as countries around the world became independent politically of England, so the churches became uh, independent of the Church of England. And we've seen that in different times in different places. So the United States of, the, of America, the church, the Episcopal Church, which was then known as the, um, the Protestant Episcopal Church of the USA, became independent in 1789. South Africa followed in 1870. Interestingly, South Africa had a, a divide, really, as to whether or not they wanted to become independent. Uh, the majority of bishops wanted to uh, become independent of the Church of England. Others didn't. And the Church of England in South Africa was formed back in 1870. It's now known as Reach South Africa. But that was probably the first example of having two uh, Anglican expressions within one area. Rwanda's had an interesting um, history, like quite a lot of other um, churches. But in 1962, Rwanda joined with uh, two other country, African countries and formed a province uh, together. And then in 2007, Rwanda had reached uh, such a size and such a um, sense of doing its own work uh, that it became the Anglican Church um, in Rwanda. And 2019, um, they actually changed their name. I just used their, their new name, the Anglican Church of Rwanda. And that was partly because they wanted to remove the word province uh, from their church to say that actually um, they, they weren't so connected to Canterbury that they were merely a province um, of the Church of England. And then in Mozambique and Angola, we saw, saw the uh, newest province. Uh, again, here we've seen two um, countries uh, coming together because of language. They are uh, Portuguese speaking countries and therefore they've been given a province of their own where Portuguese will be the first language. So the impact of political independence has had tells a story about the way in which the Anglican Communion has been formed and also different environment, different places have had a different experience of that independence and therefore the relationship with the Mother Church, with the Church of England, uh, can be different in different places. The first Lambeth Conference took place in 1867. The Lambeth Conference has been seen as the sort of original instrument of unity. And here, the bishops of the Reformed Church in visible communion with the United Church of England and Ireland gathered for three reasons. Because of unease over liberal ideas and overzealous bishops, there had been an, a, a bit of a, a, a to-do in South Africa. They gathered to consider the conditions of union with the church at home. And they gathered to consider the reunion of Christendom as missionaries had gone out around the world. They'd worked alongside other missionaries from other denominations. And there was that real sense of wanting to bring together the visible church as one. So the instruments of communion have developed over time. Initially, it was to do with the relationship any particular church had with the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, then we had the Lambeth Conference from 1867. And during the 1960s, as uh, many churches became independent and there was that sort of sweep of democracy over the world, um, the Anglican Consultative Council was formed, a democratic body uh, where bishops, lay people and clergy from each province would be represented. And then finally, uh, in the 1970s, uh, the Archbishop at the time decided that it would be good to have meetings uh, more regularly of just the primates, the most senior archbishop of each church, to come together for quiet and leisurely reflection uh, in order to be able to uh, deal with the issues of the time um, and maintain good relationships. It's not actually an instrument of communion, but it's worth talking here about the increasing role of the global south. In the 1990s, the Global South geographically asked Anglican Consultative Council um, to provide them with a place where they could speak about the issues that affected them. They were dealing with famine, they were dealing with war, they were de dealing um, with persecution. And these were issues that the Western churches were less interested in. And they wanted some time and space to think about how that they would be able to um, create an Anglican church that was suitable for their environments. 
and the South to South encounters were created. Over time, they became a, a little bit more forceful and actually started to describe themselves as the Global South Conference, uh, separating themselves slightly from the Anglican Consultative Council. And then in 2021, uh, they agreed to change their name to the Global South Fellowship of Anglicans and that membership would no longer be based on where you lived, but what you believed, uh, with the Cairo Covenant being put forward as uh, an expression of um, orthodox Anglicanism. So why was Gafcon needed in 2008? Well, we could perhaps go back to the Garden of Eden to talk about um, the the history of um people questioning God's word. But at the very least, we can go back to the 60s, where what we've seen is Western arrogance um, in terms of the cultural um, changes that have taken place in the West being imposed upon the church. And we're not going to go through all of these meetings. But what I want you to see is that over and over and over again, the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Church of Canada during the 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s were making statements um, and and acting in ways um, that were uh, novel within the Anglican Communion. And the Church of England wasn't out of that at all. The first report on human sexuality was actually given in 1979. Um, the heat and motion at General Synod was a very orthodox statement, but that was in response to the pressure that was being put on General Synod uh, to make changes. Um, the Osborne report was actually a much less orthodox report. Uh, It was given to the House of Bishops but not published. Um, Issues in human sexuality, even back in 1991, was saying that um, being in a same-sex relationship should not um, separate lay people from taking communion or being baptised. In between those things, you've got those instruments of communion meeting um, ever more regularly to try to sort out uh, the problems that were being caused. So seven key dates, um, 1996, uh, we'll start and we'll come up to the invitations to the Lambeth Conference uh, in 2008. So the right of judgment was a judgment given uh, by the ecclesiastical court of um, the Episcopal Church USA. Bishop Writer had ordained a man who he knew and was publicly in a same-sex union. Remembering back in 1996, there was no such thing as same-sex marriage. The Orthodox uh, took Bishop Writer to court. Um, on a heresy trial, uh, but they lost. And this is what the um, right of judgment said, that there was no core doctrine prohibiting the ordination of a non-celibate homosexual person living in a faithful and committed sexual relationship with a person of the same sex. So I think 1996, the door is now open uh, for change to take place within the Episcopal Church. Following on from that, in 1997, at the South to South Encounter, uh, there was real concern about what was what was going on in the United States of America, and they put forward a very orthodox statement on uh, scripture, family, and human sexuality, and that really set the scene for the Lambeth Conference in 1998. Were there three ways of life? Uh, one could be celibate and single. One could be married in a heterosexual relationship, or one could be in one of these same-sex um, committed. Uh, relationships, or were there just two, celibacy and heterosexual marriage? Lambeth 110, after much discussion, came up with a relatively orthodox statement. In view of the teaching of scripture, upholds faithfulness in marriage between a man and a woman in lifelong union and believes abstinence is right for those who are not called to marriage. So very much chose the idea that there were two ways of life that Christians were called to. It also recognised that there are many among us who experience themselves as having homosexual orientation. And many of these are members of the church and are seeking the pastoral care, moral direction of the church and God's transforming power for the living of their lives and the ordering of their relationships. And that we, they committed themselves to listen to the experience of homosexual persons and wish to assure them they are loved by God and that all baptised, believing and faithful persons, regardless of their sexual orientation, are full members of the body of Christ. But at the same time, rejecting homosexual practices incompatible with scripture, it called on the people to minister pastorally and sensitive to all, irrespective of their sexual orientation, and to condemn homophobia, the irrational fear of homosexuals, violence within marriage and any trivialisation and commercialisation of sex. 
They also made clear they could not advise the legitimising or blessing of same-sex unions, nor ordaining those involved in same-gender unions. Now, it's important to remember that at this point, Lambeth resolutions were carefully crafted. Uh, they were debated, amended, and then voted on. And so at the Lambeth Conference in 1998, when Lambeth 110 was put to the vote, 526 bishops voted in favour, 70 against, and there were 45 abstentions, which is often considered a real um, overwhelming win for the Orthodox. However, it's worth noting, over 100 bishops actually avoided the vote. And within um, the, before the end of the conference, 185 bishops signed a letter saying that they pledged that they would continue to reflect, pray and work for your full inclusion in the life of the church. The letter was written to the LGBT community. So the seeds of the difficulties were already there in 1998. And so we move to a tale of two bishops. We're now in 2003 um, and we're going to first start in the Church of England, where in May of 2003, Geoffrey John was appointed to be the Bishop of Reading. He'd been in a same-sex relationship since 1976. He claimed during um, the uproar that took place afterwards that it ceased to be sexual in the 1990s. Um, but, and there was, as I say, there was a huge uproar when he was appointed as the first openly gay bishop in the Church of England. Ironically, his appointment was announced while the Archbishop of Canterbury was meeting with primates in Brazil. They were dealing with the fact that the one of the dioceses of the Anglican Church of Canada had approved liturgy for blessing same-sex unions. And they put out a very strong um, statement. As I say, there was a great uproar around the country and eventually um, Geoffrey John rep was reported to withdraw his acceptance in July 2003. Meanwhile, across the Atlantic, Jean Robinson, who had been married, uh, and then divorced in 1986 when he entered into a same-sex relationship. He'd been elected bishop by the New Hampshire Diocese in the June of 2003. And consent had been given by the General Convention in August 2003. So at that point, the whole of the Episcopal Church, USA, was saying yes to an actively homosexual bishop. And that caused uh, another crisis to, to spread around the world. And there was an emergency primates meeting in Lambeth. So just to, to, to put that into some context, they'd already met since the Lambeth conference. They'd met in uh, Porto in Portugal, in Canuga in the USA, in Canterbury, and as I mentioned before, in Brazil. And each time they put out statements that were backing up that Lambeth 110 resolution and warning the United States and Canada but it was not an appropriate thing to push forward on these issues. So in 2003, uh, they were brought to Lambeth for an emergency primates meeting. And this is where they said, if his consecration proceeds, we recognise that we've reached a crucial and critical point in the life of the Anglican communion. And we've had to conclude that the future of the communion itself will be put in jeopardy. This will tear the fabric of our community at its deepest level and may lead to further division on this and further issues as provinces have to decide in consequence whether they can remain in communion with provinces that choose not to break communion with the Episcopal Church. They couldn't have been clearer. And yet, just a few weeks later, Jean Robinson was consecrated as the Bishop of New Hampshire uh, by the majority of the Episcopal Church's bishops. Now, that led to real crisis in the United States. And um, we started to see more churches uh, leaving um, the Episcopal Church and what was what became known as cross-border interventions taking place. These churches, these dioceses, they look to their friends in the global south uh, for Episcopal oversight. Um, now, those arrows don't go to particular locations, but uh, within Canada and within the United States of America, we saw places like Nigeria, Rwanda, Uganda, Southern Cone uh, offering alternative Episcopal oversight. Um, in the sense that um, churches within the United States or churches within Canada actually became little outposts of the churches of Nigeria, Rwanda, Uganda and the Southern Cone. Now, to try to manage this crisis, uh, something called the Windsor Process started. That was because it was based on a report, the Windsor Report, uh, that was first received in 2004. Uh, and that made um, some 
recommendations as to what needed to happen. And really, that those recommendations were proper apologies and repentance from the United States and Canada, and a withdrawal of this kind of alternative Episcopal oversight. And they met in Dromantine in Northern Ireland, said the same thing. And they met in T- Tanzania uh, in 2007. Why did they have to keep meeting? They had to keep meeting because the United States, uh, particularly, but Canada as well, were not entering into this process at all. Um, they were passing resolutions which gave kind of half apologies um, and they were continuing uh, to pass resolutions uh, around the issues of homosexuality and blessing civil unions uh, which w- were against any sign of repentance. Finally in Tanzania uh, they set the date of the 30th of September for the Episcopal Church USA um, to fulfil their requirements of the Windsor Report or face the discipline of being separated from the Anglican Communion. However, the next crisis was the invitations to Lambeth 2008. Before that deadline had passed, Rowan Williams sent out invitations to all the bishops in the Anglican Communion, including those who had consecrated um, Jean Robinson. Only two bishops were left out, Jean Robinson himself, and Martin Mins, who'd been consecrated by the Church of Nigeria to serve in the USA. I think that was the the really uh, hard point, the idea that those who had uh, attempted to care for the uh, offer Episcopal oversight to the Orthodox uh, were being treated in the same way as those who had been schismatic. So what do we think of the instruments of communion? Well, the Archbishop of Canterbury, by his action, uh, had undermined his own position as Uh, an instrument of communion. The Lambeth Conference had been undermined. Lambeth 110 obviously did not have any moral um, uh, weight within the communion. The Primates Council had been ignored seven times by the Episcopal Church in Canada. And the Anglican Consultative Council, often thought to be the most progressive of the instruments of communion, um, had made statements asking for the Episcopal Church uh, to follow the Windsor Report, and they too had been ignored. So we have now uh, two provinces within the Anglican Communion who do not think they have to listen to the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Lambeth Conference, the Primates Council, the Anglican Consultative Council. And we have an Archbishop of Canterbury who's more interested in visible unity uh, than actually dealing with the problems. So what would you do? Well, the Orthodox gathered to talk to say, how are we going to deal with the future? Uh, And there was a meeting in Nairobi in, in December 2007 of those who had been in, had been involved in the conversations and discussions and uh, uh, the missionary work that had been going on. And at that meeting, as it was suggested that a conference to discuss the global Anglican future before Lambeth 2008 uh, would be a really helpful way forward so that the Orthodox could gather uh, and then consider what could be said at the Lambeth conference, whether, whether even to go to the Lambeth conference, a decision could be made together. And so it was decided that the Global Anglican Future Conference would take place in June 2008, uh, and it landed in Jerusalem as the location. It's worth saying here that not everybody was in agreement about this this plan to move forward. Some really senior figures in the Global South, Archbishop Munir Anis, Archbishop John Chu, uh, and in fact the Bishop of Jerusalem, all raised concerns about this conference. Uh, Not that they thought that. a conference wasn't needed, uh, but I think from what I've read, uh, there was a concern that meeting before Lambeth would be seen as an aggressive move, whereas meeting after Lambeth would give the Lambeth conference a chance uh, to have uh, more conversation. But GAFCON did take place in June 2008. There were more than a thousand people gathered, as I said. Uh, we had that moving speech from Archbishop Akinola and What happened out of it was uh, the writing of a statement known as the Jerusalem Statement. Uh, It said that they'd met in response to three facts, the acceptance and promotion within the provinces of the Anglican Communion of a different gospel, contrary to the apostolic gospel, the declaration by provincial bodies in the global south that they are out of communion with bishops and churches that promote the false gospel, and the manifest failure of the communion instruments to exercise discipline in the face of overt heterodoxy. I don't think anybody uh, could question those three facts. 
And they went on uh, to say GAFCON is not just a moment in time, but a movement in spirit. And they hereby launched the GAFCON movement as a fellowship of confessing Anglicans. They published the Jerusalem Declaration as the basis of their fellowship, and they encouraged GAFCON primates to form a council. So you can start to see the beginning, uh, a grouping within the Anglican communion um, of those who wish to confess the, the faith that once delivered to the saints. And they were very clear they were not breaking away from the Anglican communion. They were often described as a breakaway uh, movement, but GAFCON has never said that they are leaving the Anglican communion. They've always said they are the Anglican communion. They also, um, and I suppose controversially, said the time was now right for the formation of a province in North America. So what has GAFCON achieved over the last 15 years? Well, that movement continued. Um, they've met every five years in Nairobi in 2013, uh, where there was a real sense of uh, the East African revival shaping the meeting, um, the nature of true repentance, not just for those who, who are being called on uh, can still to repent uh, around the world, but also of ourselves living in the light, um, uh, looking uh, to be open and honest about our own failings. Uh, building partnership, evangelism, discipleship, transformation. If you've never uh, heard it or read it, or you haven't read it for a long time, I really recommend my Govee's statement to the um, conference on the grace of God or the world or the West, uh, a truly a prophetic uh, speech uh, that was made. Um, and also in 2013, the Anglican Mission in England was recognised as a mission organisation to work with churches inside and outside uh, the Church of England, so that there was a need for uh, a new mission organisation within England. And you can read all about that in the Nairobi Communicate and Commitments. In Jerusalem in 2018, um, uh, one of the largest groupings of Anglicans ever took place. And we saw this extraordinary um, uh, letter to the churches that was uh, written during the time. We saw a launch of nine networks over and over again that there, there was this sense of a mission. We will proclaim Christ faithfully to the nations. And um, again, this wasn't a sense of um, declaring war, but instead it was about building up structures and relational networks that can move the gospel forward to do evangelism, discipleship, church planting and business as a mission. But to meet in Jerusalem meant that some had not been able to get visas. And so in Dubai in 2019, there was a special sort of mini GAFCON uh, for those who um, were serving in restricted situations, made mainly in, in um, Islamic countries. and. Um, there we heard some extraordinary stories of what it was like to live and work and um, seek to uh, be a disciple of Christ in such uh, complex and dis difficult situations. And so new provinces and new dioceses have also been formed. We've spoken already of the Anglican Church in North America, but as our other Western provinces have followed uh, North America uh, down the same route, We've seen churches, uh, the Church of Confessing Anglicans being formed. We've seen um, the Church of Brazil being formed. We've seen the Anglican Network in Europe being formed initially uh, to care for those in Scotland, uh, then to care for those in Wales, and now to care for those in England. And the Diocese of the Southern Cross, which is there uh, to, to look after some of the churches within Australia, where dioceses are, are beginning to make these the same kind of decisions about blessing same-sex unions. More than all of those things, I think it's be, become a network of relationships, opportunities to serve one another and with one another. One of the beautiful things at, at GAFCON in 2018 uh, was the seating plan, uh, where everyone had to sit in a particular uh, chair, and that meant that we you, little groups were formed uh, that each day would pray together, and, um, and talk together about what they were learning. Sort of little example, uh, this lady here um, is the chaplain to the Archbishop of Uganda, and um, I met her first in Canterbury in 2016. And when COVID crisis started, I was working for GAFCON UK, and we started to do some work on helping people to use Zoom so they could get their churches onto line. Alison heard about this, came to one of the meetings, uh, went to her archbishop and said, you know, this is what we need to be doing in Uganda as well. 
uh, one of the problems they had was uh, the level of mobile phone reception, the level the level of um, Wi-Fi was not good. And so what did the Anglican Church of Uganda did do? They started a, a building project of putting up uh, mobile phone masts in their different parts of each diocese in order that the, the churches could communicate with each other, but also as a service uh, to their local communities. So that was a classic um, example of the sort of network of relationships formed uh, by meeting people around the world. So why is GAFCON needed in 2023? Let's just think about the Church of England, not because it's the most important, uh, but because it's the home of the Archbishop of Canterbury. And in 2014, we got a new Archbishop of Canterbury who did inherit an Anglican communion that was massively divided. Many of the Gafcon primates weren't attending um, primates meetings. Um, It really was a a massively divided and unworkable communion when he arrived. And he'd been given the job of bringing it back together. He said there is a prize, the quest for which it's worth almost anything to achieve. That prize is visible unity in Christ despite functional diversity. And if we even get near it, we can speak with authority to a world where over the last year we've seen more than ever an incapacity to deal with difference. I think this was the beginning of seeing uh, where the Archbishop of Canterbury's, uh, Justin Welby's theology would take us. Visible unity, functional diversity. And that actually it was that visible unity that would enable the world to see Christ. So almost the more functional diversity there is, the more the difference of opinion amongst the people within the church, the more extraordinary it is that they can gather together. And therefore, the more extraordinary Christ appears. And that's what's driven him over the last decade. And he's been assisted in this by David Porter, who he'd worked with in reconciliation in Northern Ireland and other places around the world. And he said at General Synod in 2014, at the start of the shared conversations about human sexuality, it is my job to reconcile. I hope 80% of the Church of England can find a place of compromise. Fracture will happen. And that's what's been driving the last 10 years, um, both locally in the Church of England and globally and in the Anglican Communion. We want visible unity, functional diversity, a place of compromise, accepting that some fracture will happen. And to give him his due, Justin Welby, Archbishop of Canterbury, was able to bring together a primates gathering in 2016. He called the the primates together. He invited the primate of the Anglican Church in North America to come along, even though they were officially not part of the Anglican Communion. It was a place to, to talk together and uh, he persuaded the Global South GAFCON primates to come on the basis that the agenda would not be set by the Archbishop of Canterbury, but it would be set by all the primates, and that there would be the opportunity to talk about how the Episcopal Church and the Church of Canada would be disciplined for what they had done. So it was really a, an attempt to go back to that uh, Windsor process and get the answer that should have happened uh, back in 2007. And so they gathered and they talked for almost three days about issues of human sexuality. And in the end, they came up with this addendum A, uh, which was published um, just before the end of the primates meeting. It was leaked and it showed what the primates agreed to about human sexuality. If you can, you can read it all the way through. But I think one of the key areas is here. It talks about the fact that keeping with consistent position of previous primates meetings, such unilateral actions on matter of doctrine without Catholic unity is considered by many of us as a departure from the mutual accountability and interdependence implied through being in relationship with each other in the Anglican communion. Such actions further impair our communion and create a deeper mistrust between us. And this results in a significant distance between us and places huge strains on the functioning of the instruments of communion and in the ways in which we express our historic and ongoing relationships. It is our unanimous desire to walk together. However, given the seriousness of these matters, we formally acknowledge this distance by requiring that for a period of three years, three things would happen. Let's have a look at those things in more detail. Three years, the Episcopal Church would no longer represent them on ecumenical and interfaith bodies. The Episcopal Church shouldn't be appointed or elected to an internal standing committee, and the Episcopal Church should take no part in decision making on any issues pertaining to doctrine or polity. There was a desire to say that actually you we haven't kicked you out yet. However, you are not Anglican enough to be able to represent us 
or make decisions on anything to do with doctrine or polity. And they asked the Archbishop of Canterbury to appoint a task force uh, with the intention of a restoration of relationship, rebuilding of trust. So uh, a desire to see that discipline take place, the church, the Episcopal Church to repent and for the Anglican Communion to be able to come back together. Why was it three years? Well, quite rightly, the primate of the Episcopal Church was unable to speak on behalf of his church. They have a democratic process that has to be gone through. And the next general convention of the Episcopal Church wouldn't take place for another three years. So there was no way of the Episcopal Church making the kind of statements that were required for repentance to be seen uh, for another three years. It wasn't a case of putting them on the naughty step for a little while. There was a desire to see real repentance. And these conditions that were put on them, the things that they needed to do, were echoed the Windsor Report. And they re- repeated the requests that had been be made at Dromantine and Dar es Salaam. So it was as if the primates were saying, let's go back those 10 years and we're going to give you another opportunity to do what you should have done then. And to be honest, from uh, my understanding, the primates, uh, I was there in Canterbury supporting right, the Gacon primates. There was a sense in the room that what had been failed at Dromantine and Dar es Salaam was now going to take place, which is why uh, this caused such an uproar. Through the week, it was clear that everyone uh, who was there had come with a desire to try and understand each other and listen to each other, the spirit of the meetings. Uh, was was good. Um, we were all together, and um, as we went through the week on, I think it was Wednesday, everyone unanimously indicated that they wanted the churches of the Anglican Communion to walk together, and there was no exception to those who voted for that. That was a one of the three votes we took in the week. It was a public vote, and it was universal and unanimous. Um, As I say, the decision that we would walk together was unanimous. And I was very pleased that we agreed to walk together. I don't agree with everyone uh, around the communion. They certainly don't agree with me. Did you hear what he said? He spoke truthfully at the start of this press conference when he said that they wanted to walk together. That vote did take place. But then, of course, Addendum A had been written, and that was the agreement that they had all but the Episcopal Church agreed to. It is our unanimous desire to walk together. That's true. But there's a however. Given the seriousness of these matters, we formally acknowledge this distance by requiring. The Primates communique that came out on that Friday It was not agreed by the primates, not even seen by the majority of the primates. The unanimous decision of the primates was to walk together, however painful this is, and despite our differences, as a deep expression of our unity in the body of Christ. And then we've just seen Justin Welby at the press conference. It was our unanimous decision to walk together and to take responsibility for making that work. That's why, as I sat in a little kind of conference room um, in Canterbury, as we watched that, I saw grown men cry. And it wasn't until I understood the history of the decisions of the primates over decades that I understood why these men were devastated. It was a case of here we go again. And since the primates meeting of 2016, we've just seen an onslaught of Western provinces realising that they can do exactly what they want you can just keep on going. The Episcopal Church never fulfilled uh, that their, their three-year ban. The Anglican Church of Canada, Brazil, Scottish Episcopal Church, Church in Wales, and now uh, the Church of England um, have all made decisions to walk away from the, the biblical um, understanding of marriage. But there we have the Lambeth Conference. Like the Lambeth in 2008, there were going to be no resolutions Uh, It was announced that there would just be these things called Lambeth Calls, uh, discussion documents, uh, opportunity to think about things, and uh, then a call on the world for churches to decide whether or not they wanted to sign up uh, over the next decade or so. And what we saw about the Lambeth Conference was a a division, to be honest, same analysis, but a different approach being taken. 
It's really important to recognise that GAFCON and the Global South Fellowship of Anglican Churches are still very much overlapping bodies. The chair of the GAFCON uh, primates is also the treasurer of treasurer of the Global South Fellowship of Anglican Churches. So there is a massive overlap between these two groups. But those who would identify themselves predominantly with GAFCON, uh, their view was we can't walk together and so we shouldn't go. We need to make it clear visibly that we are not walking together. The Global South, on the other hand, said, we can't walk together, you're absolutely right, but we can gather together and we can contend. And actually, in God's goodness, I think these two different approaches played out really well at uh, at the Lambeth Conference. The Archbishop of Canterbury was playing the same game that he'd been playing in in, in 2016, in the call about human sexuality, which was really the, the, the one big reason why so many people of the Global South said they were going to go there and they were going to uphold um, Lambeth 110. He said, we're called by Christ himself, both to truth and unity. This There is no attempt to change people's minds in this call. Truth and unity must be held together. But church history also says that this sometimes takes a very long time to reach a point where different teaching is rejected or received. I neither have nor do I seek the authority to discipline or exclude a church of the Anglican Communion, and I will not do so. So he has said there is now no discipline within the the Anglican Communion. It is quite possible for there to be uh, different truths whilst claiming that we are united. And into that space stepped the Global South Fellowship of Anglican Churches and this man, Archbishop uh, Bardi Arama, who uh, was quite extraordinary throughout the Lambeth Conference. As the Archbishop of Canterbury continued to say, as bishops, we remain committed to listening and walking together to the maximum possible degree, despite our deep disagreement on these issues. And he repeated that over and over again during the conference. There was Archbishop Justin Body saying very clearly, today in Canterbury, we may be gathered together, but we most certainly cannot walk together until provinces which have gone against scripture and the will of the consensus of the bishops repent and return to orthodoxy. He also said a communion is where you have one belief one doctrine. And here there is an issue where there are two different doctrines. How can you walk together? But the spin was out there. The papers were reporting constantly that Welby had united the bishops with a compromise on sexuality. uh, And that just wasn't um, the case. We tried to get to the bottom of it in one of the press conferences. One of the American journalists said, your grace, do you accept speaking to Justin Welby? Do you accept that the Global South Fellowship of, of Anglicans have said they are not walking together with those who do not abide by Lambeth Resolution 110. The answer was mumbled. Uh, It took a little while to come out. And then Archbishop Justin Welby finally said, I have to confess to not reading with remorseless interest every press release that's put out by every group connected to the Anglican Communion, because that would be quite a lengthy undertaking. I'd probably not never get anything else done. That kind of insulting language doesn't really help. But I did look at that one and uh, uh, it's what it says. After that, he didn't speak about the bishops walking together anymore. But 30 years on, the Archbishop of Canterbury, from 30 years on from Lambeth 110, the Archbishop of Canterbury wrote, I write, therefore, to affirm that the validity of the resolution passed at the Lambeth Conference 1998-110 is not in doubt and that the whole resolution is still in existence. But in that way, the call states the reality of life in the communion today. There is no mention of sanctions or exclusion in 110.98. There is much mention of pastoral care. We have a plurality of views. So the Archbishop of Canterbury takes something that was written uh, 30 years ago, says that it's still in existence, and then reinterprets it to say that the statements that say that they cannot recommend uh, the ordination of those in homosexual relationships or the um, blessing of same-sex relationships, we now just say we have a plurality of views. And that's the key, I think, to where we are as an Anglican communion as we go into um, GAFCON 4. There was no debate about this. There was just discussion. There was no vote. It was just determined by the Archbishop of Canterbury. We now have a plurality of views within the Anglican communion on issues of human sexuality. In fact, it's become the ultimate adiaphora. If some of that doesn't make a lot of sense. Do feel free to go back to the Anglican Futures blogs. We were blogging throughout Lambeth. There are some blogs back in August, uh, particularly explaining the whole idea of plural truth and how Lambeth uh, created that as an, uh, an Anglican communion understanding of truth. And so that opened uh, the door um, for the events of this year with 
the Church of England proposing prayers of thanksgiving dedication for God's blessing for same-sex couples. The language is exactly the same as we see we saw at Lambeth. We want to continue walking together. Uh, we're going to look at a gracious interpretation of doctrine and notice they're honouring the reality of the differences within the Church of England across the Anglican Communion and among ecumenical partners. What was brought into the Anglican Communion because of a lack of discipline now becomes the norm for the rest of the Anglican Communion. We've reached one milestone, but there is further to go as we see God's co- coming kingdom uh, together. Uh, where will it? Where will it end? That's a question. Uh, that we we are asking within the Church of England. And as the College of Bishops met uh, last week, uh, they said very clearly that they were going ahead with this work. Um, Pastoral guidance will be being written, the prayers of love and faith uh, will be being refined in the light of the feedback from General Synod. And as that language that was being used by the Archbishop of York at the time, not for a settlement, but for pastoral reassurance, uh, to ensure freedom of conscience for clergy. And that, of course, is freedom of conscience for all clergy, not just Orthodox clergy, but those who want to be able to do, to bless same-sex unions. The GSFA and GAFCON responded really with one voice uh, to these events. Um, the GSFA questioning the Archbishop of Canterbury's fitness to lead, uh, to, to announce them that they would have to be out of communion with the Church of England. Um, GAFCON stating that uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury has abrogated his fiduciary responsibility, violated his consecration vows and shredded the last remaining fragile fabric of the Anglican Communion. So we come to Glasgow 2023 and wonderfully uh, what has been sort of two overlapping groups, it appears, will be coming together to some extent at that conference. Uh, the Global South, uh, GAFCON will be taking part in collaboration with the Global South Fellowship of Anglicans and there will be uh, much uh, more to say about these matters after the conference. So what uh, do we see? That rescue mission is still going on. There's been manipulation. The gospel has been denied. Uh, More and more parts of the Anglican Communion are departing from the scriptures and proclaiming a new gospel. Um, We need to keep saying that this is is apostasy. This is not just a a slight difference of opinion. It's not something which we can walk together uh, over. And who knows how it will all play out. Uh, Lots of different organisations working together uh, and lots of ideas about the way in which things might happen. If you've not read Stephen Knoll's 14 Theses for Global Anglicans, I would really recommend reading those. Um, The um, link is at the end of this um, presentation. Stephen Knoll has been a theological advisor to GAFCON since before 2008. But realignment is never simple. We have to recognise that. Not just think back to 1870, where REACH SA and the Anglican Church of Southern Africa both came out of a, a, a conflict within the church. Within the Episcopal Church of America, we still have the communion partners, those Orthodox uh, members who have remained within the Episcopal Church. And we have the ACNA. And within uh, New Zealand, we've seen the Anglican community of St. Mark's. Orthodox folk who stayed within the Anglican Church of New Zealand and those who've left to form the Church of Confessing uh, Anglicans, Eritrea and New Zealand. As the bishop of that confessing church has said many times, the principle is clear and how we respond is cloudy. So what can we pray for? Let's pray for one holy Catholic church, uh, just as that first Lambeth conference was looking for, always reforming within the bounds of orthodoxy. Let's pray for wisdom. Any council can err. Gafcon won't get everything right. The Global South won't get everything right. Let's look for honesty and transparency and humility humility as we meet together. And let's pray for love, patience, kindness, the fruit of the spirit working amongst uh, all those gathered in Kigali. But whatever the structures that come out of it, I think what we'll see more and more of is the Canterbury Communion focusing in on that institutional unity, that idea of visible unity. And that is always going to be there where uh, where power is at play, power of uh, keeping people in the institution in order that it appears that there is visible unity. Whereas I think that the biblical unity of the new Anglican communion will be based on that purpose of doing mission. It's interesting that the Canterbury communion, whilst kind of throwing away orthodox ethics, has actually just become a place for moralising. If we look at the calls, the Lambeth calls that came out in 2000, Uh, And 22, what we saw was a list of things that could have come out of any uh, sort of political conference, moralising about the way in which people should live rather than talking about the mission. 
which shapes so much the biblical unity of the new Anglican Communion. And I think it's it's sad, isn't it? The Canterbury Communion, in some ways, was formed. Uh, it was formed in the Reformation, but it was also formed in a way that was was convenient. Many of us have entered the Canterbury Communion for uh, reasons of convenience, and what we're going to need to see uh, in in the future is a commitment uh, to Anglican doctrine and and a commitment to being brothers and sisters in Christ around the world if we're going to remain united in that kind of biblical unity. I'll leave us with the words of Dr. Ashley Nall. He was speaking uh, to the Gafcon primates, and he said this, in conclusion, mission, I say mission. Mission in our hearts, in our heads, in our hands, in our hopes, in our failures, in our dreams, in all our lives and at our death, mission. For mission has always been the essential DNA of authentic Anglicanism since mission is the very nature of God's active presence in our midst as the church militant. Thanks be to God, our Lord will not rest until we and all that are his are revealed as a church triumphant for all eternity. So some ideas for further reading and watching. There's some great things out there. Thoroughly recommend Mike Ovi's talk. There's a great little documentary um, on the GAFCON website. Obviously, I'd recommend the Anglican Futures blog. If you want to read slightly bigger books, I can recommend The Global Anglican Communion by Stephen Knoll, uh, particularly Essay 7, and um, this book, Being Faithful, which was published in 2008 uh, about the shape of historic Anglicanism. It's, it's a kind of commentary on where the Jerusalem Declaration um, came from. For those of you who don't know much about Anglican Futures, uh, we are a charity. Uh, we are volunteers for now, although we are trying to raise some money to get some help uh, with uh, administration as things become busier. Uh, we offer practical and pastoral support and analysis uh, through our blog for faithful Anglicans in England and uh, uh, Europe. Uh, we are free at the point of need. We rely entirely on donations. And if you don't sign up to our regular roundup emails, uh, do feel free to subscribe on our website. You'll find that at www.anglicanfutures.org. Uh, we are on Facebook at Anglican Futures and Twitter. Uh, it would be great to hear what you think of this uh, presentation uh, in those places. Thanks very much for listening.